get started here. So a little bit about me. So the first thing I want to say is that even though this presentation is about uh, truth and facts and the truth as opposed to alternative facts and things like that, I want to make it clear that I'm not coming to you telling you that I have any particular relationship with the truth better than anybody else, nor do I know any particular truths that I'm going to impart. I am really here to say that facts do matter, and if we're going to try and make decisions, we're going to need data. Even voting, voting decisions, life decisions, any decisions, in order to inform those decisions, you do need data. And that kind of gets you into my bio. So I have a background in the digital marketing trades, which goes all the way back to the 1990s when I built some of the very first websites that were ever created. In fact, I remember when I was creating one, this may, this may or may not resonate with folks, but um, I was told by the agency that I was working for that the entire uh, page could take up a total of nine kilobytes, which is about... I figured it out, it's 0.05 of the size of a typical web page today, which is over a meg. So this was really early, and there was a lot of tricks that I had to go through to make that happen. Um, and then, so I, I learned about digital marketing and why it's different from regular marketing insofar as you, you can know who's coming and you can know what they're doing. This is one of the reasons why digital marketing and the web in general became so very popular so very quickly. It was because companies knew this, and they had been relying on proxy methods to understand their audiences. And this gave them a chance to understand their audiences much better, which is why they adopted it. Um, in 2004, I co-founded an organization called the Digital Analytics Association, which has now merged with the American Marketing Association. But uh, that just happened, uh, I believe, early this year. So for a number of years, it was the kind of premier organization supporting the study of user behavior. So um, the way I was involved in that was I had a company that specialized in, um, I don't know if anybody here has heard of a thing called Google Analytics or things like that. Essentially, these are tracking tools that uh, with some computery stuff that you do on the back end. You put code on the page that the user doesn't see, but it's there. You've all heard of cookies, I'm sure. Um, these is, that's, this is how they know who's going where. Did they, you know, for instance, if I'm working for a big uh, uh, brick and mortar product company, they will have a page about a product, and they will have pages that are trying to get people to look at the product. And the way analytics would work is, did anybody look at those first pages? How many people got past it to the second page? How many people finally got to the page you wanted them to be at? And how long did they stay there? Did they just stay one second and leave, or did they stay 12 seconds? And did they click on something else? So all these things add up to intelligence about the user, which is what made all this stuff so attractive to companies. And what, uh, so, so I did all that for a few years. Um, based on that, I was given a chance to write a book, uh, which was called Digital is Destroying Everything. Now, I'm promising you that my, that my publisher, when they asked me for a book proposal, they were not expecting a book with that title, because I was a guy who was making my living in the digital trades, except that what I saw was that we were being far too optimistic about it. This was, uh, you know, uh, you know, Obama was president. Uh, we were post-racial. There, were, you know, everybody thought we were just going to glide on into a very happy future, and that digital was very much under control. Uh, and I felt that I was seeing a lot of signs that it really wasn't. Um, I kind of talked about things like um, nation hacking at nation, and um, the undermining of of civic discourse. And I remember especially, I don't, does anybody here remember when there was an earthquake in Kingston? Anybody? I, I, you remember, oh yeah, yeah. You, it was years ago when Twitter was first getting started. I was at a conference in Kingston about Twitter. And um, all, there was a lot of people there saying uh, how excited they were to have participate in Twitter and what a great democratization this was. And I got up there and said, well, 
I, I get that. It's very exciting that everybody now has this power. But you understand what's going to happen is that this is going to be, and, and Elon Musk, by the way, bore me out years later when he said the same thing. I said, this is going to be like the town commons, okay? The middle of the, the middle of the town, everybody shows up, trades gossip, some people are liars, some people are telling the truth, some people are troublemakers. And you, unless you know them, you don't know what, where they're coming from. So it means that you don't necessarily have a reason to trust what people are saying there, because it could be anybody saying anything about anything. And there's no such thing as fact checking, or you know, which we used to count on journalists for, which is something I'll get to. And so um, that book was so early in its in its uh, ahead of its time, if I may say so, or or at least it was nobody wanted to hear it. I mean, that's another way to put it. Um, but uh, when I went, uh, when I decided, I was talking to a friend of mine out in Silicon Valley. And he was saying, you know, a lot of that stuff you were saying were right. And I, I noticed that, you know, the amount of disinformation and lying is just starting to really get out of hand. And so I said, I think I should write another book about it. He said, yes, I think you should. And so I did. And I sent it back to the same publisher. And they said, you know what? That other book you wrote did have some good predictions in it. So we're going to publish this one, too. So they did. And that came out this, this month called Army of Liars. Um, now, the, my presentation is not about the book, but the book is about the same thing as the presentation, more or less. It goes into other things as well. But if you want to know more about this subject, you could always get the book. Um, and so uh, that's been published, and I've been doing some library talks uh, between, let's see, uh, Poughkeepsie and Northampton. That whole, so that area, I've been doing a bunch of talks. And I, one thing I will tell you, and I don't, I'm not saying that this is going to be the case here, but what I've discovered is that um, almost nobody knows what some of these basic principles are, especially when I start talking about the laws that are involved. And I will I'll t tell you right now that one of the laws I'm going to talk about is called Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act. Um, which is the foundation of all social media, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But what I found is that people don't know about this. And it's, to me, a little surprising because here we have these trillion-dollar industries with massive influence in the United States. And the only reason they can exist is because of this law that no one seems to really even know about. And I'm going to tell you about it. So... Uh, I'd like to start off with some concrete information because often I've been asked, well, what is the real cost of this? Uh, why does it even matter? Well, so here's for the business folks in the room. <clears throat> the cost of it is, is estimated to be $100 billion by next year, according to the World Economic Forum. This means how much do companies have to spend on lawyers and reputation management and the impact of disinformation on society, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, that's all well and good, but I have a feeling that it misses the point. I don't think the point is how much money we're going to have to spend on it. I think the point is, what is the cost of losing trust in anything that we hear from anywhere? And by proxy, what is the cost of perhaps even losing our political system, losing democracy, because it's been overwhelmed by an avalanche of lies and disinformation that are purveyed by trillion-dollar publishing companies. Um, so what I want to talk about here is why, essentially the question is, why social media? Uh, so we've had disinformation, we've had liars, we've had propaganda. We've had politicians who tell half-truths. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is not new, right? We know this. However, as a nation, we've never had the kind of discord that we have today in the absence of some huge external crisis. Actually, the external crisis has ten tended to pull us together. 
But now, uh, in the absence of any, I'm going to call, you know, huge societal crisis, if I may say so, uh, we, are, we are in a condition of mutual dislike. People cannot stand each other on the left or the right. Uh, one, you know, one side is saying that the other one, you know, kills babies as soon as they're born. And the other one says that, you know, they're Nazis. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you that I think the rhetoric is okay, but I am here to tell you that it's just really unfortunate that we've been driven apart the way we have. And I suspect, and I think I can demonstrate how the role of social media's business model has contributed to this. <clears throat> social media um, purports to empower the individual, uh, where anybody can post anything and anybody and everybody can see it, right, theoretically. If you put something on there and it goes viral, as they say, you will have accomplished exactly as much and maybe more than any billion dollar media company could have hoped to achieve. And they typically spend, you know, they literally spend billions of dollars accomplishing this. And what's flipped the script is that the social media companies have made it so that the individual can leverage this communication system and get their word out to anybody and everybody if it works out that way, right? So uh, I call it the myth of personal empowerment because um, there was, uh, back in 2012, I think it was, when some of these social media companies were just sort of getting started, uh, the um, per CEO of Google at that time was a guy named Eric Smith. And he said, what's going to happen with social media is that um, – the balance of power in media is going to shift from the big media companies to the individual. And I would have to say that he, he turns out to have been kind of right. Okay, Social media has jumped up immensely in, pop, in popularity and influence, and the influence of all other media has kind of plummeted. That includes cable, that includes news, that includes magazines, that includes news websites, non-social media websites. Their traffic's down, social media traffic is up. So he's kind of right about that. But here's the problem. Um, this is not an environment that is necessarily being taken advantage of by well-meaning individuals who have a story to tell. It's being leveraged by bot armies driven by AI to create fake content and to impersonate people in the United States and to deliver messages without you knowing where it came from, like where it actually came from. And a ton of it is coming from foreign actors. And they are sending messages over here that comport with their worldview. Um, and for instance, there are, you know, when you, anytime you look at something, it's like, who has the motive, who has the means? Okay, well, Russia, for one, has the motive and the means, and they are doing it. Uh, there was a, a case not too long ago where a, comp a media company here in the U.S. called Tenet Media was basically busted up by the Department of Justice because it turned out that Tenet Media was taking money from the Kremlin and then paying podcasters and giving them stories that they should be talking about. And lo and behold, those... Stories were kind of like exactly what Vladimir Putin wanted them to say. And once that whole thing got busted, these podcasters were shocked. And they're victims too. And, you know, whatever. But this is the kind of thing that goes on. So uh, this, when the social media companies talk about bringing people together, uh, that is sleight of hand. That's not what they're about. There's only, and I'm not here to tell you that they have a, a a nefarious plan for us because they don't. They have a plan to make profit. And the, uh, as I'll illuminate a little later, um, their only goal is profit. And their algorithms are tuned to deliver more eyeballs so that they can sell more ads. 
And what we found out, and again, I'm just kind of setting the stage here, what we found out is that these algorithms are set up to promote discord because they figured out that that's what keeps people on the site longest. Way down the line is kittens. <laughs> but it's mainly discord. And so you have a business model that is set up to make people angry at one another so that they can make bank. Uh, I find this problematic. So uh, the danger of disinformation, I mean, we saw that thing about the, the dollars spent and all that, and I agree that that is a big deal. But I think what's far worse are the intangibles. For instance, where... Uh, we don't believe anything anymore, even when it's somebody who's telling the truth, because in an environment that is so filled with unsubstantiated claims or outright lies, and it's just this constant barrage, okay, which is something that unfortunately seems to have become normalized over the past few years. I'm old enough to remember when it wasn't like this, uh, but I know a lot of young folks probably are not aware that it didn't used to be like this. But we're in an environment now where it's like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Yeah, I get it. You don't believe it. How can you tell what's, what's true and what's not true? Well, you can, but it's a lot of work. And not everybody has the time or inclination to do that. And it makes sense. Why, why would you spend half your day trying to figure out if what you read was really true? Well, that's what the liars are counting on. They're counting on the fact that you're not going to do the homework and that you're just going to be there saying, well, I don't know, maybe that's true, maybe that's true. And as I get to later, um, that's actually called the liar's dividend. They, they win in an environment where nobody believes anything because their lies, which they know are lies, are stacked up against truths, but nobody can tell the difference. So that's how they win. Uh, cynicism in general is driven up by these uh, by by discord in social media so that uh, and, and I characterize cynicism as when you doubt someone's motives when wh whoever it is and whatever they're saying you're like wait a minute who wait wh why are you saying that what is your reason for saying that and you know half the time it's a it's a good response but the other time it's uh, something that's clearly not believable but we don't have any arbiters anymore. We don't, like, I know I'm going to probably tell myself that I should have waited to say this, but uh, we used to have a thing called fact-checking in this country. And, and those, those, this thing called fact-checking was done by places called newspapers and magazines. Uh, they were called writers and journalists. Uh, these professions have cratered. Okay, we fired them all. Okay, we used to buy the paper, New York Times, four bucks. What, you know, the the local paper, three bucks. We'd buy them every day. Nobody. I mean, I'm going to tell you a little story. I was in uh, Penn Station a couple months ago, and first of all, it took me about a half hour to find a copy of the New York Times in Penn Station, which was kind of shocking. I found one. You know, they're kind of small now. So I get on the train and I'm reading it, and this guy, random guy, he says, you know, you're probably the last person in New York City who's sitting on the train reading a New York Times, and I'm like, I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> but um, so in essence, I guess what I'm trying to point out is uh, uh, we, we, di we got rid of these people. We're not, we're, we're not paying them anymore. We're getting all our information from social media, right, where we're not paying a nickel. Well, guess what? The social media companies are saying, we'll provide any, all the news you want except for one thing, the fact-checking. You won't get that anymore. And that's kind of where we're at. So it's up to us now to determine whether what we think is true is true or not true or whatever. And it's, it's a little bit of a slog. Um, so as I learned in my career in digital analytics, um, you can't make this, one of the common things that, that digital analytics people love to tell their clients is that you can't measure what you can't, you can't manage what you can't measure, which means you can't make decisions about stuff unless you understand what's going on. If you have, you need data in order to make some kind of decision. Like if, for instance, the scenario would be we have a website, we don't, or we did a marketing campaign, did it work? 
uh, well, yeah, we can find that out. We can look at the web traffic and see whether it actually d delivered a result, right? Those are important facts. But if you don't have them, you, can, you would never know whether that was successful or not. And if you take it out into the public sphere, um, you also need some kind of truth and data in order to make decisions on. And if you're in a situation where, well, let's just say, for instance, one party has a candidate who seems to not know what truth even is and just routinely every single word out of their mouth is a lie, if you have that kind of situation, it's corrosive. After a while, you start to lose your sense of, like, how bad that is, and it starts to get normalized. And I think we're kind of seeing that, right? We're seeing that where, you know, some people call it sane washing, where, you know, uh, mainstream news will, will put up, you know, the, the, the positions of one party and the positions of another, but um, I try not to take sides, but I can't help it. <laughs> if you have one side who's coming up with, policies which may or may not be flawed may you know maybe they're not 100 percent clear but they're 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 policies right of the kind that we recognize from all prior candidates and then you have a guy who comes in and doesn't have any policies he's just about basically hate racism uh and, and saying terrible things about people and yet you'll go to the news and it'll sound like there's policy positions in there. And the fact is, I don't know if there are any policy positions in there. Maybe there are. But the problem is that these be th the lies become normalized because they're, they're just put together in a way that's like choice A or choice B. Well, somebody, somebody was saying, well, the, ch the real choice between those two types of um, inquiry are so I'm, I go to, you know, I'm on the road and I have to go to the gas station and I have to get something to drink. Well, so I'm at the pump and um, I'm debating, should I go inside and get water or should, or should I just put the pump in my mouth and drink from the pump? <laughs> That's kind of where we're at. And so I feel like these lies that, are, that have become so common in, in, our, in life and all over the media, they are inimical to democracy. You really can't run a, a, a true uh, voter-supported system if the voters have been subject to years of total lies. And I'm not saying that this means the press was always telling us the truth or that they were 100% reliable, because they weren't. Uh, we can look back on you know, the days when uh, the mainstream press was saying, you know, we were winning in Vietnam. Uh, we had to destroy the village to save it and things like this. So we, you know, I'm not trying to say that newspapers were just engines of truth, but they tried. They didn't just, their program was not lying. Their program was, we, th we think we're getting the truth. They may get it wrong or they may misreport or yes, of course, they all have some kind of agenda, but they generally had to avoid just pernicious, dangerous lying. And there's a reason for that. Um, they're not protected by Section 230. So the reason why uh, social media is a perfect vector for disinformation is two things. One is that they're a vertically integrated publishing system, which is uh, something that they don't want you to think they are. They want you to think that they're a new animal, that they're not publishers, that they're some kind of unique thing that is... Uh, I, I, I liken it to saying uh, they're blind and not blind at the same time, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but um, they also are protected by this law, Section 230 of the 1996 Communication Decency Act. So here's what that law is. <clears throat> so it was created in 1996, before there was really much of an Internet. I mean, there, was a few, there were websites, but they were very minor. And I can tell you that at that time it felt very scrappy and very kind of uh, almost revolutionary because all the big companies were kind of getting ready to get their asses handed to them, if I might say so, because they just gave, they decided to give away all their content. 
I mean, this is one of the biggest blunders in American business history. It's like, let, you know, we've been charging money for all of this stuff. We spend all this money developing. Oh, but the kids are giving it away, so we're going to give it all away now. Well, that was that was the end of their business model. But it was the beginning of the of the Facebook business model because they said, um, we don't need to produce anything. Well, you, you guys just come in and give it to us and we'll promote it. We're not going to spend a nickel on it. You, you, everybody just come in and give us whatever you want. We'll put it up. So uh, the law was created back when, um, before social media, in a time of what were called bulletin boards. I don't know if anybody remembers these <laughs> from CompuServe and uh, Prodigy. You know, I'm selling a bicycle. Call me. You know, that was the level that these things were. And it really was not unlike, um, you know, the, the bulletin board at the coffee shop. You know, you, uh, you would not want the coffee shop owner to be held liable if somebody came to the bulletin board and put up pornography or something vicious about somebody. You would expect them to take it down, of course, but you wouldn't say they were responsible. So that's in the spirit of what it was created, because you wouldn't want these little electronic bulletin boards getting blown out of the water for libel because of some crazy thing somebody put on there. And, and that makes perfect sense to me. The second part of it uh, said they, they can choose to not publish what you send them, which also makes sense, just like any publisher. I used to send short stories to publishers. They would reject them. I would get angry. <laughs> But I didn't think, I didn't call it censorship. It was just that they didn't want to publish it, right? So they have that right. Well, the problem, of course, is that you can't have both rights at the same time. You can't say at the, at the level of an internationally powerful trillion dollar industry that is enormously influential in society that you have both the right to decide what you're going to publish, but then once you publish it, you have zero liability. Even if it's a murder film, even if, it's, uh, e even if it is an uh, invitation to violence, even if it is doxing someone, even if it is an invitation to harm to a minor, they are above the law very, very literally. And I'll tell you a little story that proves it. I don't know if anybody's heard of a case called Gonzalez versus Google, which was decided at the Supreme Court last year. It, it's based on the 2015 uh, Paris nightclub attacks. Uh, one of the people killed was an American. Her name, her last name was Gonzalez. And her father um, uh, went, went in, in to look at, like, how did this happen to my daughter? And he uh, started looking into how ISIS, which was the, the, the uh, terror organization that fomented the attack, how did this happen? Well, it turns out that ISIS, which, is, by the way, is no longer a terrorist organization but a media company, they, they deploy a artificial intelligence to create little suicide bomber movies, trying to get kids to volunteer to be suicide bombers and... You, well, I'm not even going to go into it. You can imagine. Anyway, so they, you, they, you, they, they made videos that recruited murderers to go to Paris to kill people. And guess where they put those videos? YouTube. And guess what YouTube did? Because of their algorithms that say, let's say you're someone who likes... I'll go back to kittens again. Somebody who likes kittens, right? If you say they're going to show you nonstop kittens after a while, because that's what their algorithm is. This, this person wanted this. We'll give them more. They wanted this. We'll give them more, because that's what keeps you on the site. Well, they really don't care what the subject is. So, if it's that you turns out it seems like you really like those those videos where the where the jihadists are gunning down, you know. Uh, Western, you know, young teenagers in nightclubs. Wow, that's that really gets you off. And YouTube says, "Hey, would you like to see more of those? We have lots of those. Well, here's more and more and more until that person is radicalized. 
So ISIS is deploying the YouTube algorithms. YouTube is advertising around this stuff, okay, and using those clicks, the engagement levels to say, hey, we've got loads of engagement. Our stock price is going to go up. Awesome. Um, so um, meanwhile, the, 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 problem, the problem becomes um, where... We don't, we don't have, we, so let me just get back to my point here about G Gonzalez in particular. Gonzalez's daughter was killed in Paris, and YouTube did all that stuff. And then Gonzalez said, I'm going to sue Google. I'm going to sue Google for proximate cause to my daughter's death. In a, I don't know if familiar, anybody here familiar with tort law, but this is a pretty common thing. Like, for instance, if a car company builds an automobile that's obviously defective and, it, and for some reason the front axle keeps breaking and it smashes into a tree and it happens like 50 or 60 times, at some point somebody's going to sue that company and they either can demonstrate that this was some kind of fluke that they've been trying desperately to fix or they're going to say, gee, uh, yeah, no, we really weren't doing much about it. And if, they, and if it's that they weren't doing much about it, they're going to lose a lot of money, okay? Social media does not have to worry about it because they cannot be sued because of Section 230. They are immune to any of this, so they literally do not care about this, okay? <clears throat> and, then, and then we have the worst, I think the most ironic part is that there are companies in this country that are liable for those things. You know what they're called? Newspapers, magazines, websites, anybody, anybody, even you and me, are liable for the things that we say, okay? If we go out, um, let's say uh, we go out and, you know, somebody uh, uh, says, uh, you know, they hate the guy down the block, they, you know, this is legal speech. You can megaphone, I can't stand the guy down the block. But if you go down to that guy's house and start pointing at the guy and saying, I want this guy gone, that's no longer protected speech for us, okay? We would get in trouble for that because we're inviting harm to this guy, okay? This kind of stuff happens on social media every day, all day long, okay? And, they, and, and the platform that makes it possible for the world to see these things has no liability whatsoever, okay? But guess who doesn't? Everybody else, including Fox News. Do we remember the Dominion Voting System case yes. where Dominion Voting sued Fox News because of Fox News' insistence that um, the 2020 election was stolen? They knew it was a lie from the start. They kept doing it. Dominion Voting Systems had the receipts. They... they were clearly on the cusp of proving it in court, and Fox News decided to settle for $750 million. And they also fired Tucker Carlson. $750 million is a lot of money, even for Fox. Um, and then another one, just I think it was just last week, uh, Newsmax had to settle with Smartmatic, another voting system company. They didn't disclose how much the settlement was, but that also settled. Because, small, because Newsmax, also being a TV station, not covered by Section 230. But at the same time, Meta, X, YouTube, you name it, they're all promoting the same exact lies with impunity. So we have a little bit of a dichotomy there. And what I'm, what I'm advocating is that we need to level the playing field. Like, if we get rid of Section 230, it means all publishers are running uh, under the same set of laws, and we would, ha we would be much more certain that there was real fact-checking at the platforms. And I've, I've had some folks in some audiences say, yes, but that would be hugely expensive for them. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It would be. Uh, but... Um, it's that dire. And by the way, another thing I like to say is um, a lot of people sort of at this point feel like social media companies are 
a, a force of nature and that they have a right to exist? Well, they don't actually. They're just companies. And if they break the law, they should be punished. Uh, it, right now, they're above the law. They can't break the law. They could do anything. So do you see that passing or not? What? 230? I, I see it staying where it is for now. I mean, it, it, it's, been in, it's been in place for, since 1996. I, I, I will tell you this, that uh, if, if it's not a surprise that almost no one here knows about it, that's kind of the way it is everywhere, including among legislators. <coughs> they, don't, they don't seem to be ready to address it. I saw one, one column somewhere where they said, at one point the Biden administration wanted to get rid of Section 230, but that was just, it was like a minor asterisk somewhere. So there's no real effort right now. Um, you know, these, these big companies will spend very, very heavily in Washington. And uh, there, are, there's a, also there's a right a right wing constituency who doesn't like 230, but for the other reason. And I think it's a little bonkers myself. But here's what they say: they don't like 230 because it permits the platforms to not publish everything. Now they actually and very erroneously call that censorship. We saw that last night on the debate. You know, censorship. Well, I have news for you. Non-amplification is not censorship. Okay? Censorship is when the government says, if you say it anywhere, you're going to jail. Kind of like, gee, there was one candidate who said, these people who criticize our Supreme Court should be jailed. That is censorship. Okay? Not publishing your screed that's not censorship. That's editorial choice, and it's been exercised by every every publisher in the history of publishing. Um, it's, it's censorship is where the government says you can never say this, or you're in big trouble. But right now, you can say anything you want as long as it's not you know fire in a crowded theater. But the stuff that you know Facebook won't publish. You could still stand out on your front porch with a megaphone. No one will put you in jail for it. It doesn't matter what it is. Lies are protected speech, by the way. But, you know, uh, if Facebook or whatever decides they don't want that on their platform, they're going to say no. And that's it. So that's why the, the, these other folks don't like it. So maybe there's a constituency. In any case, um, you know, in an uncertain world, which is the one we live in, uh, facts are bedrock. And I, I, it's very difficult to imagine making any kind of rational decision in an atmosphere that's so fluid and so full of baloney, if I can use that word. Um, so uh, I, I have a, a very brief little illustration of this um, where someone is relying on known technologies, but then they're approached by somebody who says, not to trust those and to trust something brand new and where that goes. So I call it the tale of the woodland traveler. The woodland traveler is hiking. They need to get to the town before dark. And in order to traverse the woods and get over the mountain and into the town, they're using two pieces of trusted and rather ancient technology. One of them is called a map. And the other one is called a compass. I know it's maybe a little hard today to think about how hard it is to make maps because they're all, you know, we can find anything on Google Maps now. But I can tell you that it used to be very, very, very labor intensive. I have a book from an atlas, a world atlas from 1902. Uh, it's all engravings. And you, had, you could not believe the amount of detail in this thing. The amount of effort that went into this is just stupendous. So... My point is that you don't do all that and then have it be inaccurate. You would, you would just be, you would go out of business. No one would buy the map. Of course it's got to be accurate. The second one is the compass. It's not perfect. It kind of wobbles around, but it's pretty accurate. It's, it's not going to point south. It may not point all the way north, but it's, you're going to generally know where you're going. Well, the grifter of the wood comes along and says, why are you paying any attention to these antiquated 
uh, questionable sources. Look at that compass. It's wobbling back and forth. That's called flip-flopping. It doesn't really know what direction it's going, does it? And then the, ma the map. Um, how do, you, do you know these people? What is their motivation for giving you this map? Uh, what, what is the sexuality of the person who decided on that map? Um, they, and, and eventually they convinced them to put the map aside and, and follow the grifter who says they know the way. Well, the grifter doesn't know the way. They know how to lead them to the camp where they brought all the other people who they caught, and they sit them in there as darkness falls. They pick all their pockets, and they leave them there. And that's the end of that story. These people are lost in the woods because they abandoned what they trusted and went with somebody new who said they had some newfangled thing, but it was mostly lies. And that's what's happening now. They're like, what are you trusting all these sources for? I can tell you what happened. Haitians are eating cats and dogs. Um, that's kind of where we're at. So why the U.S., though? Other countries are not experiencing this quite in the way that we are, although they are. There was a story not too long about how uh, there was a Chinese uh, spies that were busted in, in the Czech Republic for uh, fomenting um, disinformation in social media. But um, here's the thing. We are the powerful country in the world. Everyone cares what's going on here. Do we, whereas we hardly care what's going on there. You know we, know, we know, some of us know who the president of France is. Some of us know who the president of Italy is. They all know who the president of the United States is. And they all know who, who they want to be president of the United States. And some of them have, they, look, they've always wanted to influence elections here. It's just that they didn't used to have any way of doing it, okay? Because in order to put a commercial on TV, it had... It had, you'd have FCC rules, okay? FCC rules would say you can't take money from foreign corporations to put up a domestic political ad, okay? So you would never have seen, I'm Vladimir Putin and I approve this message. Wouldn't have happened. But guess what? Now they can disguise it in all different ways and get it into social media in a big, big way and get it all over the place, without ever admitting who they are, where it came from, or why they're doing it, okay? And they've accomplished their goal. They have gotten to people. Um, so that's one reason. We're a global target, the fact is. Uh, and so uh, there's, uh, there, there's, there's that, and there, there's their ability to leverage the mechanisms of social media, which are, which are considerable. Social media has the ability, kind of like I was alluding to earlier about studying your audience, social media has the ability to do that, I would say, a hundredfold better because it's, that's all they spend their money on. So they know that they have about a million different slivers of populations that they can deliver to advertisers. So if there's an advertiser who wants the, uh, you know, uh, I hate this, I hate that, and I'm, I'm always clicking on all kinds of evil disinformation stuff. They know who that, who that slice is, and they will sell that slice to an advertiser. They don't care who it is. It could be a criminal organization. It could be anybody. They just don't care. And so that's how you find these audiences being... Uh, victimized, frankly, by foreign actors who have bought the audience. And then they just go in there and they bombard those audiences with their message with the help of Facebook's algorithms. And then Facebook will take that stuff and say, oh, goody, this is promoting Discord, which we know is great for our engagement levels. Let's promote that. And that's what they do. That's how they make their money. Uh, one further thing I want to note is that um, we have a little thing in, in this country called the First Amendment. Other countries, you might be interested to know, they don't have one. Even places where there is a free press, they do not have anything that even begins to resemble a First Amendment. They have a bunch of interlocking laws and 
understandings that result in a free press. And by the way, I don't notice anybody complaining in France, Germany, or England that there's no free press, because there is. But uh, what we have here is a First Amendment that, that many people take to mean that you can say anything and that every kind of speech is protected. It's not true, okay? It's true that lying is protected speech, but for instance, you can't go into a theater and yell fire, and you can't go up to a person and say, I want that person killed. Social media does let you do that, though, because they're above the law. We're not. They are. And that's 230? Well, that's because of Section 230. Yeah, it's because they're protected by that law. Yeah. There seems to be three major laws that need to be that are really hurting the society today. The corporate, the corporate that they're people and they can give to uh, politicians. Yeah. Well, yeah. Money is speech. And then the last thing they did with the Supreme Court, with the president making them. Above yeah, the law. above the I mean, law. We're we'll get yeah. we, so yeah. He would join them ab above the law. Um, I, I have a further distinction to make about that. Um, insofar as they want to say that they're not publishers, which is very interesting because if you look at what they do, every single thing they do is the activity of a publisher. Uh, but they don't want you to call them publishers because that would mean they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of Section 230. They want to say they're something else. They want to, they want to say they're a special thing because of their technology and their approach. And I'm here to tell you that that is sleight of hand because it's as silly as if a newspaper said, we're above the law because we have a really special kind of ink that we spent billions in creating. <laughs> the, but what, what do we see? We see words on a screen. Okay? We, I don't care what kind of technology you did to develop it. The public-facing thing are stories on a screen, and a lot of them happen to be lies. What are you going to do about it? Apparently nothing because they're above the law. So it, it does help for us to know how to fact check and things like that. Um, you know, critical thinking is always really important, being able to uh, get out of your bubble, your information bubble. And I would hasten to add that we're all in one, no matter where, where we are on the political spectrum. Social media knows where you are on the political spectrum, and it will continue to show you stuff that more or less is about uh, belief confirmation. Oh, I always thought that was true. You know, oh, there's a story to prove it. No matter where you, they know, they know that that's what'll keep you coming back. Uh, and so you have to try and get out of your bubble by looking at alternative sources and look, you know, looking at where did that story come from? Does it have any corroboration? Does it show signs of extremism? Does it show signs of intolerance? Does it show signs of attacking people ad hominem? These are all kind of signs that there's something wrong with it. Um, all, all aspects of critical thinking. And I mentioned the liar's dividend, where it's very difficult to discern between truth and lies when the whole room is filled with lies. And the liar's dividend is such that nobody believes anything anymore, which is great for them because then it's so easy for them to just put lies out there and people will be like, hmm, okay, well, maybe that's true too because we don't really know. That's, and believe me, they're counting on that. However, I will say this about this whole part. That's, it's great for us to be doing this, but I think um, I liken it to fighting an, a, a, a tidal wave with a teacup uh, because if we don't shut off the faucet of this massive, massive amount of disinformation that is being put out there uh, by parties through the, these uh, 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 social media sites, um, uh, then we're, we're just in for a bad spell. I don't, I don't see how we can, I don't see how we will be able to get out from under it. <clears throat> so, um, here's some places to fact check. Social media platforms have none. They, they don't have any fact checking. Or, or, or let me put it this way. They say they do, but I, know, I don't know if you noticed that, for instance, um, 
when Elon Musk bought Twitter and turned it into X. First thing he did was he fired like almost all of the content moderators. That's because this is very costly. It's, it's costly for them to have people looking at stuff and deciding, wow, we really, you know, no, we don't want that on here. Uh, and, but it's, very, it, it's a big deal, and they've all kind of slacked off from it. And moreover, there's pressure on them from usually the right where they're saying, wait a minute, um, you're censoring. And then they'll just, you know, batter them about censoring. You're, you're not letting people hear the truth. No, we're actually trying to keep lies off our platform. But, you know, the liars never want to hear that. So here's a couple places that I know about. Snopes.com is, is very good, but it's, they, they only choose a few stories a day. So it's not like you'll automatically find what you're concerned about there. But they're pretty good at it. They will give you chapter and verse on how they, whether they discovered that this was fake or not. Um, so Politifact. Snopes. Snopes. Snopes.com. All right. Yeah. Snopes. They get Snopes there. Yeah. Um, and then Politifact has a a truthometer, which you'll probably see. It's uh, the pants on fire thing, which you've probably seen. Also pretty good. And then there's one called NewsGuard NewsGuardTech.com that also does that. Uh, there are a, a lot of platforms out there that help people who pay them to figure out what is real and what's not. Those are more for like corporate level. Uh, and I, I, I don't think any of us would be able to afford those. But they're platforms that do a good job of parsing what the source is of something and w why, how it got there, why it got there. It might make sense for some of the social media companies to buy some of these and, and deploy them. But we'll see, if, we'll see whether that happens. <clears throat> So a lot of people um, will say, you know, it's, it might be too late for social media. Social media is a poisoned well. Maybe. Uh, I'm not sure I agree, but I do agree that it's going to be very, very difficult to fix without fixing Section 230. I feel like if we don't fix Section 230, it is too late for social media because right now it is a sink of disinformation. Not all of it, of course, but a huge amount of it. And especially if you're one, in one of those sort of unlucky uh, quintiles, if you will, where they've figured out that you will believe all this stuff. And then they just deliver that stuff to you nonstop until you're unshakable. You're like, oh, no, uh, everything I see is telling me this, is telling me that. And, it can, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if that's all you ever see, you're going to start believing it. This is what the propagandists want. It, the social media companies don't necessarily care. They don't care about that, but they do care that you stay on their website. And it so happens that what keeps you on their website is when you're angry. And so these, these manipulators, I call them cynical manipulators, they will try to amp up the anger. And that suits them because it makes you hate other people, which means you'll vote against them when the time comes, and the social media companies like it because you're on their platform for longer, and they can sell more ads and be more profitable, and their stock price goes up. <laughs> so that's kind of where we're at with that. One other thing about social media and the age of fact-checking. So um, I, I talked about how you know we used to have fact-checking in journalism, journalism and all that stuff, um, and so to go into a little more detail of that, uh, so journalism has been with us for a while. Um, I would say that the first hundred years of journalism, say from the year 1800 to 1900, there really wasn't much of a thought for truth. A lot of it was just pure garbage. People would make stuff up. There was no professionalism. But sometime after the Spanish-American War, which was basically fomented by the Hearst newspapers, by the way, the journalists sort of started to think, you know what, I think what we want is a reputation for truth because I think that will get people to buy the paper. They want facts. Let's just try that. And so long about 1910, 20, World War I, et cetera, you started to get this sense of journalistic integrity where you had the muckrakers who would go in and expose 
corporations for exploiting workers and all kinds of stuff like this. And the press became known as kind of a change agent and a, a truth teller, if you will. And it, and it kind of stayed that way, with notable exceptions, um, yeah, until recently. Okay. Now, of course, you know, we had times when mainstream media, the press, would be like, nuclear power is going to save all of us. You know, I remember I collect old magazines. You can look at old life magazines and find lots of these puff pieces about things that we don't feel that way about anymore. Uh, but um, it, it was more the exception than the rule. The large, largely speaking, if they said that a guy went here and did this, you could pretty much count on that it actually did happen. Um, so we as a generation, as several generations, appreciated the fact that if we read something in a book or a magazine or a newspaper, there was a very good chance that it was believable. And if we were smart, we'd be like, well, not 100%, but gosh, I mean, their record's been pretty good. So I will assume that they're still like that and that they know what they're talking about. Uh, so here, here comes social media, and they're like, wow, what a, what a great paradigm. People will believe whatever they read, apparently, because they trusted it for good reason, because it was mostly true. Well, we're going to we're going to just take that paradigm and piggyback on it. But the only thing we're going to change is we're not going to have the facts anymore. We're just going to have whatever nonsense anybody puts in here. And some of it's facts and some of it's not. But people will read it and believe it because they've been trained because of these years of journalistic integrity to believe it, even though we've removed all the journalistic integrity without telling anybody. And that's where we're kind of at today. A little bit about algorithms. So an algorithm is um, it's a computer routine that runs over and over again to solve a problem that keeps occurring. So uh, when you see um, you know, any sort of uh, you know, calculation online or any, any sort of array of content, they're going, there are programs that are what they're doing is they are saying, oh, here's a user who just showed up. And by the way, this all happens in a nanosecond. Here's a user, they just showed up. What's their, what's their browser history? The cookies, okay. What, they, what have they been looking at? Okay, here's what they've been looking at. Therefore, we have like 50 different types of buckets that we can fill their page with. Based on what we know they've been looking at, again, within a nanosecond, we know what we want to send them. We're going to, we're going to send them this stuff because this is what's likely to keep them there. Okay? And it doesn't matter whether it's lies, truth, a mix of lies and truth. Really, they don't care. It's whatever they have. It's what, are you, it's what are you have demonstrated will keep you on the platform. So they just keep doing that. Okay? That's what an algorithm does. And so, uh, b by the way, their entire business model is based on engagement, okay? And one of the things you'll see me propose is a thing called an engagement tax. So in addition to getting rid of Section 230, I'm going to propose that in order to blunt the worst of it so that we can do things about it, even if they don't want to do something about it, is we might want to impose an engagement tax on the Internet. I may be the first person you'll ever see who's, who's using the word internet and regulation in the same sentence. I was one of the early people in the internet and there were many years where I felt like we don't need any regulation, we're doing fine. Well, you know what the thing was? The bad guys hadn't found us yet. Between 1995 and 2010, I don't think the bad guys knew what the hell to do with a, a, a website. And then they figured it out. Now we're in a different environment where the bad guys have totally caught up. And now we need protections against them. So that's where the whole regulations thing comes in. And by the way, I would say um, I would compare that against any industry that we've had. I'm going to take, uh, for instance, automobiles. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but give me, this, give me a minute. Uh, automobiles. In 1895, there were two cars in the state of Ohio. They crashed into one another. 
Um, by 1920, even though you couldn't drive from city to city because the roads were mud, if you were in the town, it was chaos. There was, there was no such thing as your side of the street, my side of the street, or stoplights, or traffic, any sort of traffic rules whatsoever, no speed limits, nothing. So it was totally chaotic. Horses and buggies and cars, total chaos. Well, guess what? They, they invented the yellow line. You know, you have to drive on this side. And, you know, maybe there were some people who was like, I'm not doing that. That's fascism. Well, that, fine. So don't, unless you don't want, if you don't want to get home tonight, just drive on the other side of the road. But I notice that now I don't see even the most extreme libertarian complaining about this because obviously this, te this car technology is unworkable if you don't have some kind of regulations that makes it more useful. Same thing with energy, same thing with nuclear, same thing with nearly every big industry. And I'm here to say it's time we did that with the Internet, especially um, social media. So... Um, I'm just going to run through this real quick, a brief history of fake news. It runs all the way from the Roman Empire during the, the era of Cleopatra when, uh, uh, when Mark Antony went to Egypt as, uh, uh, as an emissary of Rome and Octavian in Rome didn't like it and, and minted a coin that said um, Mark Antony is a traitor. And he convinced the Roman Senate that Mark Antony was a traitor. They went to war against Egypt. It resulted in the Battle of Actium, and it resulted in the death of Cleopatra, the defeat of the Egyptians and the death of Cleopatra. So that was the earliest one I could find. And then it goes all the way down until you get to 2017, where you've got this new thing called alternative facts, okay? Yes. Another word for lies, okay? But here's how it happened. So uh, the day after... Um, uh, the inauguration of Donald Trump, uh, Sean Spicer, who was the spokesman, came out and said that was that inauguration was was seen by more people and more people were here than any inauguration in the history of the world. And another, and someone else was like, um, gee, you know, it didn't really feel that way though. Let me have let me have a look at a picture. So they had a picture here of the the Trump inauguration, a picture here of the Obama, and lo and behold, the Obama had like three or four times more people in it. Okay. And um, so, so the on yes. Sunday, that Sunday, Chuck Todd has his uh, Meet the Press, right? And he has Kellyanne Conway on, who was oh the senior spokesperson for the Trump <laughs> campaign. And he said, um, Kellyanne, why did Sean Spicer go out there and tell a lie on day one? And she said, you're getting too excited about this, uh, Chuck. He's just giving you alternative facts. Well, that's another word for a lie. But she gave it a moniker that professional liars have been able to leverage for years now and, and act as if there really are such things as alternative facts. But there aren't. I'll give you an example. Here's a fact. The Titanic sank. Here's an alternative fact. It didn't. That's the difference. So, to wrap up, uh, a role for government, uh, yes, yes, because we already have laws about uh, hate speech, but and 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 my I guess my point is here about you know getting rid of Section 230. Why I think it's kind of an elegant solution <laughs> is because once you get rid of it, the government doesn't do anything else. It doesn't require the government to do any censoring, any talking, any suggesting. Nothing. It just makes them in the same category as every other publisher. Guess what keeps all these other publishers in line? It's the threat of getting sued in court. Okay, And the courts are pretty stringent. You can't just walk into a court with an imaginary problem just because you were offended. You have to have been damaged. So, for instance, this guy Gonzalez could say, I'm sorry, listen, YouTube, you advertise murder. Okay, you profited off of murder. Um, my daughter's dead. I think you have proximate cause. He might have had a case. And you know what? When a, comp when a corporation starts to see a downside to their behavior, they change their behavior. You can see this in any company. 
Right now, there's no downside for them to keep this up. But if there was no Section 230, all it would mean would that they'd have to be worried about getting sued, which, you know, if you're going to go before your shareholders and say, oops, we owe $2 billion because of et cetera, et cetera, they're going to be kind of angry. So it's an incentive. I think I've, yeah, so uh, let's, you know, I, I think I'd love to see us all go forward into a truthful digital future. Um, I think we all have to uh, insist on access to facts for ourselves and for others. Uh, and um, of course, I love, I, I think there's a good distinction between critical thinking and this total skepticism of the person who, quote unquote, does their own research and comes up with, 25 different falsehoods thinking that because they found it on the internet that that's true. Um, that, that's not a good outcome. Uh, and of course, I'm trying to build an anti-disinformation constituency. I do notice that it's in the news all the time. But here's what I will tell you in one closing note, is that while I hear about disinformation all the time, I don't hear anybody talking about how they're going to fix it. I, I am telling you how we can fix it. So that's what I leave you with. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes. So I'm, I'm trying to understand. Are you saying that the news sources no longer are giving information? Like if I'm looking at Time Magazine, Newsweek, things that I thought were reputable are no longer reputable? No, that, no. Um, those are not social media companies. Uh -huh. Those are just websites. Right. They're they're not accepting like you can't send something to time and have it go up right right, That's what I thought. right. no no all the news websites are just like magazines right it's only the platforms the Meta the X the YouTube you know Parler whatever all of them right there's still hope there's still yeah if we can there. if and I'm not saying I'm in love with Time Magazine, right, right. you know, th they've made mistakes too, but at least they have a paradigm that involves fact checking, mm -hmm. right? And, and the, the social well, media companies I was don't. until now because they believe in, you know, looking at a certain, yeah. you know, like BBC or yeah. PBS. And, yeah. You know, and by the, by the way, it's not merely out of the goodness of their own hearts, it's because they get sued mm -hmm. right, right. For, for lying because they're not protected by Section 230. Right. Right? It's Section 230 that frees these guys up. Yeah. Then if you could put up your last two slides, which are your yeah. summation slides. Sure. Uh, let's see. So th that one. Yes. So how do we, how do we actually get access to, to demand or request uh, those actions that you're... Uh, right. Well, um, I know that... Uh, <laughs> I know that in my book I have a letter that one could write to their, um, a sample letter that one could write to their <coughs> uh, congressperson. But it really does come, you know, I mean, that's just a sample letter, but you could probably do as well yourself. But my point is I, I'm, I'm trying to get local politicians interested in this. I'm sending my book to them. I'm trying to get them to understand that this is something that we care about, you know, as a nation. Uh, and uh, eventually it's going to have to go to Congress, and Congress is going to have to do something about it. There are people who occasionally talk about it and who occasionally have sessions about it, but um, uh, it, it's not that we don't have enough of a, a constituency yet. So what the, the head of Facebook has been in front of Congress. I don't know what for. Yes, but. yes, he has. About and, these issues? Um, a little bit? The, it's, tangentially, yes. Not specifically about Section 230, but about... The, for instance, the invitations to harm, uh, of, of you know minors and, and the political you know, stuff, right? and and right. more than anything else, it's about you know human trafficking and this kind of stuff. Which I didn't even get to that, but that's also happening on these places. And so his big thing was he got up in front and turned around and looked at the audience and says, "I am sorry for anybody who's been hurt." Yeah. <laughs> like, yes. uh, no, that's just not enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, why haven't we learned from what happened with social media? Why is AI out there without hmm. any regulations? Because I, I think that's going to just compound it everything is. you said. Oh, it you know, absolutely is. About, why didn't we learn from that? Like, 
Ah, well, because it's kind of happening concurrently. Um, and let me, I, this, is, this is the way I see it. Uh, for what it's worth, the legislators, all of them, except for maybe a very few young ones who are kind of tech savvy, I've got to be honest with you, they, I don't think they understand this stuff. I really think they don't. And so they're not doing anything about it. Like, for instance, um, it wasn't very long ago. Uh, a case went to the Supreme Court. I don't remember the case, but it was definitely related to social media. It wasn't Gonzalez versus Google. It was something else. And Elena Kagan, who's one of the liberals on the bench, said, well, you know, this is the thing. None of us here are really experts on, social, on the Internet or technology, so I'm not sure what we're going to do about this. And I, and I immediately I felt like such cringe on that, like, really? And you're, you're going to make the law that's going to govern how we deal with this super powerful technology and you don't, you're just admitting you don't know about it? How about you put me on the bench? I know better than you do. <laughs> anyway, that's where we're at. Yes? Who introduced Section 230 in 1996? Oh, my God. You had told me to look into that. I, for, I, don't, I don't remember. <laughs> I want to know the name. I don't remember who it is. It was so long ago. <laughs> but it was intended for something very, very different than what we have now. Good yeah. intentions. Yeah, I know. Well the, well, the platforms, and this is why they want you to not call them publishers, because yeah. as a publisher, they would absolutely not be yeah. protected. So. This was amazing. Thank you. Oh. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. And thank you, everybody. Thank you.